It is 12.59. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzica. Breaking news in the NFL earlier today. The league and the NFLPA have agreed to suspend all joint COVID-19 protocols effective immediately. According to multiple reports, the NFL as it pertains to COVID protocol, has fully returned to normal. Women's Hoops, the SEC tournament continues today at Bridgestone Arena, Missouri and Arkansas, currently in progress just down the street here in Nashville. Vanderbilt will be in action at 2.30, taking on 23rd-ranked Florida for the right to face Ole Miss in the quarterfinals after the Commodores defeated Texas A&M on Wednesday. Mississippi State and Kentucky will face off at 6.30, and Alabama will take on 24th-ranked Georgia at 8.30. The winner of that game will take on the Tennessee Lady Vols tomorrow. You can hear all the action on 1045thezone.com or the 1045 The Zone app, courtesy of Learfield IMG. OVC tournament play tipped off yesterday. Tennessee State still alive as they defeated SIU Edwardsville 77-62. The Tigers will play SEMO today in the quarterfinals at 6.30, and Lipscomb is in the ASUN tournament quarterfinals tonight after beating North Florida on Tuesday. The Bisons taking on top-seeded Liberty, a 6 p.m. tip-off. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once in your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Let's do this. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Happy Thursday to you. Oh, we got a Thursday song from the Hitman. How about that? Yeah, yeah, you get that every now and then. (laughs) I like that. Something must be going on good to be singing songs about it. I mean, that's pretty good stuff. Um, I don't know if we should lead with this. Two huge stories today. Number one. I mean, of course, it's the small story of the NFL dropping all of its COVID protocols. Number two, guys, I don't know if we have some kind of like panic alert or something we can play. Kenny Pickett's hands are only eight and a half inches. I mean, how's he going to play football? Oh, there you go. Breaking news. Breaking sports news on 104.5 The Zone. Quarterback hand sizes, Kenny Pickett, eight and a half inches. So I told Blaine, it's just sent the reporting, you know, community into a frenzy here in Indianapolis. And the one, Lucas, you know who the, the last successful quarterback, this was per, I don't know, Warren Sharp or one of these guys, last successful quarterback with eight and a half inch hands? No, oh, you want to you put that out there and see if people could guess? Or they just Google it, huh? Was it the guy who broke the Titans' hearts? No. In Nissan Stadium a few no. weeks ago? No, his, his aren't eight and a half, his are nine inch hands. Oh, Joe, half Joe an Burrow, inch. because. People have unearthed this tweet from him saying, thoughts and prayers, guys. I may be retiring. Apparently, my hands are only nine inches. <laughs> That's what he said at the time? Yes, he tweeted yeah, that I, out I at the it. time. See, that yeah. dude. Like, it really matters. Right. That's what he's really the saying. The number one pick in the draft. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I, I, I'm a baller. But yeah, uh, thought, and thoughts and is, prayers. You know. <laughs> and maybe that's why I pick it... Uh, you know where where's gloves? Maybe the maybe it's, maybe it's kind of his hand size because uh, it slips out a little bit sometimes uh, when he's just running around. So you just never know. I, you know, I'm not a real big deal. I know all the scouts do, and some people are going to you know shy away from him. But uh, I got to look at the tape. So you know that's that's really it. If it's not affecting his throwing, I'm I'm good with it. But that's me just because I, I like ballers and not looking at all the measurables. Some ballers don't have all the measurables. So what? You turn on the tape, you say, oh, he can go. You say, oh, okay, this guy runs a 4-6 when he ran his 40. Well, when you turn on the tape, he looks like a 4-4. Didn't that guy right there that he's guarding right there, isn't he a 4-4? Oh, his game speed is different mm-hmm. than running a timed electronic speed. So to me, that's always the end-all, be-all is the actual tape tells you who he really is. Now, you want to see who's our, you know, tremendous athletes and all these things. Uh, but doesn't, you know, garner you ultimate success in the National Football League as we've seen time over and over again. But usually in the first round, that's who goes first round. Sometimes it's not all their production. Right. It's actually their athleticism. And then the, you know, the NFL teams feel like we can <laughs> then teach him all those things and then he'll have much more success than a guy who was a really good player but didn't meet all the measurables or all the testing that you thought he should have to go to Garner being a first round pick. Think about this, and I, and I just I just pulled it up on my iPad. The goat of runs faster than his forty time is the goat Jerry Rice. No, four point seven one is what he ran at the combine. Yeah, 
Now think about that today. Guy from Mississippi Valley but he still State. Went first, he went first. He's first round. round. Yeah, but he dropped. He dropped. He was supposed to. Be, where did he go? I don't remember. He was top ten. He was. I, I didn't even though he went that. I, man, I didn't think he went that high. No, he he was a first he was round like pick. Middle round guy. Or middle first round. Guy. Um, but think about this today. If a guy from a tiny school in Mississippi ran a four point seven one, they'd be like, "Oh, this is never going to work." And in, in in those days, it didn't matter. I mean, the 49ers just believed in him. Let's yeah. see. I, I'd have to say this though. Some guys embrace and do really well in the 40 because they're taught by trainers how to actually run. And then some guys mechanically just can't pick it up in the two or three months that you're training. You know, you get it sometimes, sometimes you don't. You overthink it, you know, trying to run smoothly and all these track things. Uh, And some guys then run worse than they normally would. And that happens a lot uh, because you're trying to, you know, it's like you have the test. And so that's kind of how I view it in. You have to train to just do the test so you can win the, you know, the test score. Yeah. It's, they're giving you what it is. Now you have to go train to do the test. Doesn't mean you're going to be a successful player or not, but it will determine. It's a measurable that they use how high or low you may go in the draft if you're at the combine. And I think, what, 90% of those guys get drafted. Yeah. Some don't. And some people who don't go to the combine get drafted, as we all I know is the mayor of Murfreesboro. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Byer. <laughs> That's third round so, pick. He didn't you know, go those to guys combine. who aren't there don't feel like that. You know, you won't get an opportunity. He, by the way, it wasn't like he was a late round like me. He went third round. Third round, first pick of the third round. Yeah, Jerry Rice is number sixteen overall. Sixteen, I knew middle first round. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it talks a little bit about his time. I uh, saw him play actually in college at Mississippi Valley State. Yeah, just coincidental, uh, I got a a chance at the RCA Dome at that time. Uh, They played in a classic versus someone there, and the Boys and Girls Club got a free, you know, they took a whole bunch of us on a bus, and we went, and that was uh, my first time ever seeing Jerry. I had no idea. What I was fascinated was their offense. I remember their quarterback was Totten. I want to say his name was Totten, mm-hmm. if I can remember, is that they used to, you know, line the receivers up three in a row, like right behind each other. And then, you know, they Willie didn't know Totten. How, Willie Totten. Yeah. And then they would, they would then, because he could sling it around too. I thought he deserved a shot in the league. I don't know if he did or didn't, but he didn't, he didn't make it. Uh, but man, I was fascinated with how they would move their receivers at that time. You know, I'm what we're talking about in mid 80s or so, late 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, you know, nobody ran an offense like this that they had at Mississippi Valley State. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Because he wasn't the only one. Jerry Rice wasn't the only one getting a lot of yardage, too, by the way. They had some other guys that were doing doing really good stuff. But he was by far the best one. But they had some pretty good receivers. They – yeah. Willie Totten set more than 50 NCAA Division One AA passing records, along with Jerry – while Rice set records also. Uh, the Delta Devils, which is a fantastic mascot – Averaged 59 points a game during the 1984 season. That was 84. Okay, so I was uh, yeah, I was in eighth grade. Totten yeah. threw for 58 touchdowns. They made the playoffs. Yeah, they they were. It was pretty special. It was cool to watch because that time, you know, most everybody ran the football. wasn't it was, Yeah, they threw the football, but they weren't throwing it like that. It was kind of like the run and shoot. You know, in you know the mid 80s, it was like, wow, this is cool. And they were just putting up points, and you know, defenses couldn't figure out how to stop them really. So it was pretty cool. It's funny how I remember that, though, only because it was an actual experience. So that was, that was really cool. Do you remember their uniforms looked like Christmas? They were green yep, and red. Yeah, green and red. Mm-hmm. I think I can't remember which ones they went. They might have went white that game, but uh, in the green jersey. I, I can't remember that part of it. But, yeah, it was like they were Christmas. But it was, it was pretty cool. And then to see what he did in the league, I was like, dang, that's that same guy I saw at the Mississippi Valley game. Forgot what classic it was, but. Juwan Jennings was a slow forty guy. Yeah, you know that that and this is a that's a great example, Mickey. I'm glad you brought him up because I love his talent and his aggressive nature and his dog that he has in him. You can't teach that. Guess what? That he runs a four seven, and guess what? He did it at the combine. Didn't change anything. Might have ran a four six eight or something. But guess what? How often do you see him open in the playoffs in the slot? They knew how to utilize him. He knew yeah. he had quick twitch, still could get open, mm-hmm. knows he has to stay slim, and then he's a mean son of a gun blocker. I mean, he was burying people. I was waiting to see if he was going to bury uh, Jalen Ramsey one time because they would have been fighting. 
Yeah, I, it just never kind of happened that way. But every guy that he had to block, they was getting the business. It's so funny. He is tough. So, and you see how he was productive in this league, and he went seventh round because, and then he did it in the SEC, yep. which is the best conference, right? So why is he so good if he runs a four seven? Right. You're not even be supposed to be on the field. Matter of fact, you're not even supposed to be on the team. Right. If you're a skill guy, or you could be on the scout team. Right. Cover kicks or something. See? Yeah. So, but his game speed is different, and it's funny because the narrative on him with people who follow the SEC or certainly people in Tennessee was that guy's a junkyard dog. I don't care how fast he runs, mm-hmm. he is going to punch somebody in the face. He'll play special teams from day one. Yep. He'll go out there and play special. Never teams. Never seen a receiver go down and do what he's done on, on special teams. And that dude ain't hitting people like that. I would have moved him to safety and messed his whole career up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, receivers don't do this. I move you. But but for all of us, it's like, hey, he's a quarterback, you know. Somebody's getting a steal. It, it, whoever will just take this guy at the end of the draft as opposed to letting him hit the free agent market and pick him where he wants to go. Just, okay, seventh round then. But the national narrative was, oh, this guy's slow as Christian. He's never going to mount to this. Is why would you do that? Well, all, the people who had watched him play and people around here watched him play since high school, they knew what they knew what that guy can do. Mm-hmm. It was no doubt, no question that he was going to be in the league. long as he got to the right team, got the opportunity. I, actually, he's doing it sooner than I thought as far as on offense. Yeah. I knew he was going to do it on special team. Uh, that, that was a given. And that was probably a combination, like you said, You real, he realized, okay, slim as much as I can, mm-hmm. carries, carry as little weight as I need to to, to make myself quicker. Mm-hmm. So him figuring things out and them also figuring things out, okay, we can use him this way. Yep. Yeah. That, that, okay, so this is what he does. Let's do that with him. Yeah, because he was playing, and really he was a third down or passy situation guy, and then they would, that's when they would move Debo around. And he was in the backfield all over the place, and then you forget all about him. He's like, oh, man, he's a guy coming off the bench. I'm not paying attention to this guy. And then he's going against the fourth corner. Then he's a dog. Then he has uh, elite quickness. Getting out of his break. So, yeah, if he continues to work on his route running, I think he could be a very productive uh, receiver and, and play in this league a long time. Yep. Well, again, and, and today. Big uh, fan of his. A lot of people thought he was going to be an outside linebacker type when he got to the SEC. Wow. Or when he when he got him out of high school. They thought that was the better position. Remember, he was a quarterback. Just like right. in high school, it's like well, take let, the best athlete. Make well, it. here's what T- Tennessee did, I think, is they told him that he was going to have an opportunity to play quarterback. And right. then they let him, and then they said, yep, see, you can't play quarterback. <laughs> And then, you know, I mean, which he was solid, but, you know, playing high school and college in the SEC is a little bit different. He was a, he was still a good runner when he was playing he was. quarterback. I remember watching him in the, I think the spring. And sometimes they had packages when they would use him still in that manner. And then he could throw. So, yeah, I thought they did a tremendous job uh, with utilizing his skill set. Just imagine being that great of an athlete. And you, switch, you switch positions in the pros, which I can't even imagine doing that. But – Good enough to get recruited to an SEC school as one thing and then go there and become something else and still good enough to make the NFL at that. Yeah, that, that was pretty impressive. Boy, mm-hmm. to live like that. that that's for called a at the league. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, Greg Bishop from Sports Illustrated is going to join us uh, around 1.30. So we'll come back. Uh, combine stuff going down today. They're getting ready to start doing the on the field stuff. So we should have some. My uh, hands are. I wonder how they measure the hands, too. We're going to try to find a ruler, measure hands. our hands. We'll be right back. Blaine and Mickey, 1045. Eight and so. a half. That's small.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Uh, NFL Combine workouts start today. Uh, Greg Bishop from Sports Illustrated is going to join us here in, oh, like eight, nine minutes or so. We'll have him on. Uh, on field workouts today, quarterbacks, tight ends, wide receivers. Mm, that, it, oh, that's big for the Titans right there. If you're a Titans fan, hey, man, uh, I, 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 you know, set to VCR or, you know, or just to just watch whatever you want to sports channel or listen to this radio station. We're going to be talking about it all day. I, I'm curious, like how many people seek out the combine and actually watch it? I, at least some of it. Cause I do. Oh, but, well, I would say the majority of them that listen to us, I would say at least I would be a high number. I'm going, I don't know, Lucas, I'm going 80%. This depends on how much time if you're sitting there, but are or are you paying attention on social media? What do you mean? Are you watching? Are you just sitting down watching it, or are you paying attention? You know, also on social media, some people don't have time to be sitting around just kind of watching, but they're paying attention to some guys that may interest them or who they think should come to the Titans. So, I would say about eighty percent at least paying attention to the numbers of the players. Where do, know, do you, what fa- you say? What do you say? Where Lucas? do you fall on this, Lucas? I- I'm curious, uh, like your age group, because. Is that something that interests you? You're like, I can't wait to get home and watch the guards do three cone drills. It's going to be amazing. We're cooking out tonight, and then we're going to watch that. <laughs> I have friends that, that uh, you know, are very attentive to it. Now, those friends that I'm thinking of are psychopaths when it comes to, you know, leading up to the draft and just consuming all of the draft coverage they can, kind of like you, Mickey, but... I like me, the way you lump me in with the psychopaths. For Thank me, it was, always, it was always just kind of background. Like, it would be mm-hmm. on, but it was always mm-hmm. just more background noise. I, I never really watched the Combine intently until really working in this business. I don't know. I feel like the majority of, the, of people understand that the next few weeks are going to be nothing but draft talk and just kind of sit back and, and let it come to them instead of actively seeking out the NFL Combine. <laughs> like, I'll, if something happens, if something notable that I need to know about about a prospect for my team, then I'll know about it. So somebody goes today and runs a four two nine or something. You're like, I'm sure I'll see it on Twitter. Sure, I- I'll be fine. Anything of note that ha- Kenny Pickett's hands are small, you- yeah. you'll find that. But out. But a lot of times, the, the biggest stories that come out of the combine, I feel like, end up just becoming so irrelevant when that career plays out. Because John Ross shattered combine news when he ran that forty time, and he's done nothing in the league, absolutely nothing. And then the hand size conversation and the bench press. I just feel like a lot of the biggest storylines that come out of this week. It's obviously a big week and important. It's a multi-million dollar, you know, all these franchises are making multi-million dollar decisions. But I just feel like ultimately the biggest storylines that come out of it, you know, when we fast forward eight years, we look back and say, okay, did that really have that big of an impact on that player's career? Mm. Yeah, John Ross, that shows he was a straight line guy. Well, who did he play for? What Washington. The Bengals Wa- drafted No, him. no, the Bengals oh, drafted He played yeah, for Washington. Washington. He played uh, yeah. for Washington in That in team college. that made the playoff. And right, and they played Alabama. Alabama and yeah. that told me not to draft him. You know Why? He got gun shy. Gun shy in the football terms. I'm going to give you football talk means he's soft. He's soft. He got hit a couple times, and I mean he got waylaid. Was it against Bama? And Bama yeah. in the playoffs, oh, and he never yeah. saw. He hardly ever played after that. Yeah, they yeah. got shellacked. Yeah, he got hit, and, and they, got, they got destroyed. Yeah. But he hard, that told me that he's not tough. When the going got tough, the star player ducked. He went out. He was done. And I was like, I couldn't draft him. That right from that moment, I wouldn't have drafted him. Now, you, that, that, now the Bengals, of course, they, they were <laughs> infamous for that because he did phenomenal on everything else. But it was mostly straight line speed on the testing. Uh, but see, that shows you that's not always the trait you should follow. Uh, and it, it's random. Nobody has uh, you know the crystal ball to tell you when it does and does it. Uh, but I, I just man, after that, I really did not. And I didn't watch him a lot in college because he was on the West Coast. But when I saw him there and everybody was hyping him up and how good this guy was, and uh, so I watched him a couple games at the end of his college career, and then when he got to Bama, and when he played them, I said, well, those DBs are pro DBs. If he can't do it against them, and that means they're – that don't mean that those dudes are going to start for Bama in the NFL, but they are pro DBs. Right. And he couldn't do anything versus them. Nothing. I, I remember you coming in after the playoff game, and you were fired up, yeah. and you said – this dude, everybody says a first round pick. And remember, it was it was uh, Corey Corey uh, Davis, and then Mike Williams, and then him. Yeah, right? it was only those yeah. three. Yeah. Only yeah. those three. There was a run, yeah. a real close run after the Titans took Corey Davis at five. But you were like, "Hey, man, that, that dude, eh, no, nope. I wouldn't nope. be drafting him. I mean, no, 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 can do. Mm-mm. 
Because if you want your star players and if he was supposed to be that kind of guy, which you're supposed to be when you're first round grade and first round talent like that, then when the going gets tough, guess what? Then all your other players are going to disrespect him. And he's supposed to be somewhat of a leader, regardless of if he's a rookie second year or not. He's supposed to be one of your better players. Uh, and I, I didn't like the chuck and duck in there that he was doing. Mm-mm. No, I, I would have rather for him play hurt and kept on fighting through it. And I would have said, you know what? That dude, he managed through, played okay, but he was hurt. I respect that. He did. He he was like, nope. He started thinking about, eh, well, you know, I'm going first round, chilling. You don't know. You could catch a couple passes, man, with your talent and change this whole game. Yeah. He did not. Mm-mm. He yeah. did not. And then we see now, is he even in the league? Nothing, nothing against him, but, I mean, I know he got injured early in his career, like with hammies and things of that nature, and he kept getting a shot. And that's one, another thing about first-round guys. They'll get multiple opportunities, and that's what perturbs me. He's with the Giants. Yeah, see? I mean, why is he with the Giants? If he, was, if he was drafted 214 like I was, he wouldn't have a job. Yeah, he'd be watching Little Giants on right. TV. Cause. Yeah, so, I mean, so there's something about him that tells you that he doesn't get it yet. Well, he yeah. signed a one-year deal, one-year, two and a half million dollar deal last March. Oh, with the Giants. So listen to this. This is his games played. He played eight and twenty. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He played three in 2017. He played 13 in 2018. He played eight in 2019. He played three in 2020. And that was the end of his – they didn't pick up his gotcha. option, so he was four and done. He played last year. As Lucas was saying for the Giants, like, okay, prove it, man. Yep. First-round pick, let's get you in here. New surroundings. He played in 12 games. He had 11 catches for 224 yards. That's it. His well, whole career nice – little average there, though. Oh, it's 20-plus. He popped a little bit in 2019. Had played in eight games, had 500 yards, a few touchdowns. But, yeah. He kept getting injured and was always yeah. soft tissue, kind of like uh, – it's like if Marcus Johnson for the Titans would have went first round and you just kept giving him opportunities. You see the talent. You know he's good. I think Marcus Johnson is actually a better player. He just he just can't keep the hammies right. Fast, can run routes, great hands. When I saw him catch the ball versus the Saints and destroy Lattimore, I was like, uh-oh. I think they got something here. That transcontinental thing where he just was running and, cut and just caught the ball and just kept running. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Lattimore is in my top five corners. And I was like, dang, then next – I don't even know if he finished that game, but the next game or something, he pulled the hammy. I was like, What, oh, what do you do man. with a guy like that? I bring him back again for the minimum and see if he can stay healthy. And but would use him only uh, It's to prove to me that he could stay healthy. He has too much talent. Yeah, he, I, it's just like, oh, if I could just get him to stay healthy like half of a season. So between him and Julio, if they could just flip whenever they're healthy. Each play eight games. Mm -hmm. Well, one yeah. play eight, one play nine. Yeah, I'm good. Do you I remember? Think you got a high level player there. Do you remember us? We <laughs> were either talking about that after the game. Um, he was the fastest receiver on the Titans this year, correct, Marcus? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Marcus Johnson. But it, that the history was there, and it proved out. I mean, he just keeps having soft tissue injuries. Right when they bought in, he, it was started at the beginning of the season because he didn't even – he did well in camp, and then all of a sudden he got injured right at the end there. So they were trying to massage it along. He got a little tight. He was uh – oh, it was bothering him a little bit. And then he finally got healthy, and they put him out there, and I think what well, maybe for three games or so, but one game he just lit it up. And I was like, mm, it was the Saints. So, yeah, then Boom. Pop goes the weasel. People are sending me messages. I'm just tuning in. Who are you guys talking about? Talking about John Ross? Oh, yeah, John <laughs> Ross. <laughs> Don Davenport was like, like, who in the world are you guys and talking about? he had a about? great career, by the way. Where did, He went to Washington. So, I mean, I, I just wouldn't have took him, me personally, because it, it wasn't – that showed me he wasn't mentally tough. I want mentally tough players, all of them. You, you don't have to be the elite of the league. You got enough ability, you're here. But I, I got to have mental tough guys. Hey, we just had Kelly Harper on the other day. She was up, oh, God, I don't want people to get caught up in the, oh, my team to be physical and tough. Well, no, she wasn't just talking about the physical side of it. There's a mental side to every sport that you must be mentally tough. Because when the going gets tough, the elite players rise. Right.
the average players kind of stay the same. The ones who don't want to be no part of that, they duck their head. It's like, you know, when your dog ducks his head and he know he did wrong. He said, what you doing? You better go to your room. He ducks his head and the tail go down. That's what happens to the athlete. Disappears. That's real. Well, they start having that deer in the head like, look, you go, uh-oh, we in trouble. Like, a, a, a good example, McNair. Remember I'd say he come to the sideline? Especially that game he came back after the back surgery. He's like, hey, man, I got him. I'm like, <laughs> finally? It's third quarter. <laughs> I got him. Most people would have been like, man, I'm having a tough day. Maybe they should have went with Neil Donald. It's my first game back. He was coming off the field like after a third down and out, three and out, fourth down. I got him. I mean, looked at our defense and like I got him and pointed his <laughs> finger. I'm like, what you got? I wanted to call his bluff. <laughs> I was sitting there watching this jumbo trial. I was like, man, he, dang that dude, he got him. <laughs> well, we we got him on the phone. We got Greg Bishop of Sports Illustrated, the senior oh, writer who, who joins us. That's right, Greg uh, Blaine Bishop. Greg Bishop. It's always nice to have a little family reunion here on the uh, Mark Spain Real Estate <laughs> Hotline. How you doing? Yeah, he was. He got I'm the smarter well, gene. Having me, and I would say that uh, I'm the unathletic cousin in the family. You know? Yeah, there you have it, right there. He's the smart <laughs> one. So yeah. <laughs> so while while literally while Major League Baseball has left each other and, and just flown in different directions, Ooh. meanwhile the NFL just keeps trucking along, and we're going to watch people in spandex do bench presses and run forty yards. Okay, Millions are going to watch. I, I'll ask you this because I'm curious to get your thoughts. As of right now, at this second, what is the biggest story in the NFL? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, to me, it would be the quarterback carousel that is going to really pick up steam here. You know, whether you're looking at Aaron Rodgers or Jimmy Garoppolo or some of the guys that are being, being floated as potential trades like uh, Russell Wilson. You know, this is a draft, I think, that sort of informs that scenario. There's not a lot of top quarterback prospects in it. I think you have a lot of teams that are obviously in need of a quarterback that's, you know, that good. And what we've seen the last two years is Tom Brady goes to Tampa, wins the Super Bowl. Matthew Stafford goes to Los Angeles Rams, wins the Super Bowl. And all this just reinforces what we already know. You need one to win or you're going to be in trouble. And I think that I'm already sick of some of the back and forth, uh, you know, with Rodgers and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's the biggest thing because it's going to shape next season, you know, which could look significantly different based on where some of these people land. Here's what's so crazy about the league, because that's absolutely a lot of people would say, oh, it's the quarterback stuff. It's all the quarter. Just 30 minutes ago, a, an email circulates or a memo. They're dropping all COVID protocols. And and this league is so big. You're like, oh, my gosh, I, I don't know. I got to think about what the big there. I'm just trying to make the point. This league is a juggernaut, and there's nothing slowing it down. There are so many stories all the time, and we're months and months away from a game being played. Absolutely, and to me, that's instructive for Major League Baseball. Like, you know, the NFL doesn't stop for anything. Yeah. Now, we can quibble with some of their decisions, some of the things they've done in terms of, you know, rule changes or discipline or how uneven that has been, but they just keep rolling. You know, they have this goal of $25 billion in revenue, and it seems like they'll do whatever they can to make sure they realize it. And I think baseball is shooting itself in the foot right now because they're taking a game that's already declining in popularity and making it, you know, harder to like it. And I think they could learn from the NFL that there is a machine and it, it's never going to stop rolling. That's true. The machine that is Greg Bishop from Sports Illustrated joins us now on Blaine and Mickey. Well, Greg, I want to go back in time a little bit here. I know the Rams and Matthew Stafford, the season has uh, passed, but uh, you have a little bit of details on how this all came about. Kind of give us, you know, some insider information more so or less about how he got to uh, meet up in Cabo with the head coach McVay when he was, our, he was still a Detroit Lion. Yeah, I loved how this went. So Matthew Stafford was supposed to go to the Bahamas last last winter. You know, he had actually made the plan, got the plane, all the kind of stuff that, you know, people who are superstars do that are different from how we travel. And, you know, there was like some sort of hurricane warning, so he decides to go to Cabo. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, there's a rain forecast, like really bad rain, which is very unusual. So Sean McVay's girlfriend calls Melissa Whitworth, who is uh, the wife of their left tackle, Andrew, and decides they're going to go to Cabo. 
in the interim, this dude, Clint Bowling, who happened to play for, of all teams, the Cincinnati Bengals, realizes that his friend from college, Matthew Stafford, and his friend from Cincinnati, Andrew Whitworth, both happen to be in Cabo at the same time. He connects them. They play golf. Stafford becomes available. Sean watches tape. And Andrew had a very pivotal moment there. He basically told Matthew on the golf course, you need to make the best decision for yourself, but you need to make it carefully because this is going to be your legacy. And then he said, I left Cincinnati in a place I was really a pillar in because of Sean McVay. Fast forward a couple nights to dinner. You know, Sean and Matt have met. The, the families have been hanging out. The deal's close to done. And uh, nobody's seen Sean McVay. They can't figure out where he is. They can't figure out what's going on. They go to a restaurant for drinks, and McVay walks down, you know, hair perfect, same as always. <laughs> gestures at Matthew Stafford and says, guys, this is your new quarterback. And that three-day sequence of very odd events really shaped NFL history. And, you know, my favorite part was um, Matthew called his be best friend that night, a guy named Pan Lucas. And he said, uh, I'm going to win the Super Bowl and I'm going to get a ring. And here we are all these all this uh, month later. And you know, to me, um, history was really made in that moment. So, wow, that's an incredible story. Insider, you talked about legacy in this decision and how everything came about. How is Matthew Stafford's legacy going to look? If this is his only Super Bowl that he wins, and he has some success, but they don't get back or win a Super Bowl, uh, do you think uh, it would be looked upon as, as a Hall of Fame type uh, career uh, if he never wins another one? Yeah, I do. But I would understand if people wanted to argue that, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of Matthew's friends feel like we meaning media kind of moved the goalposts on him, you know, you get 10,000 yards and 20,000 and 30,000, you know, fastest right. to a lot of marks in NFL history, part of this definition, you know, this generation of, of passers that really made, you know, passing the NFL to be the main thing. And, you know, I think that for me personally, when you look at his role in these playoff games, he did have some turnovers, but you look at the throw to cup against the Bucks, you know, that's an elite throw that this season ends if he doesn't make it. You look at the no look to cup on the drive where they scored in the Super Bowl. I mean, those are the reasons you bring in a player like Matthew Stafford. You know it's not going to be perfect. You know the arm talent is otherworldly. And you just hope that in the moment that you need him to do something like those passes that he does it. And you know, I think there's still a lot to be critical of in his game, whether it's the amount of turnovers. He obviously tied for the league lead last year with the rookie quarterback, uh, you know, some of the head-scratching stuff. But I think you have seen him get safer and, you know, evolve over time, became, becoming more of a technician. And uh, to me, like, the, the really the only thing he needed, and Calvin Johnson said this to me for our Super Bowl cover story, was that ring. Personally, now that he has it, I think he's in. But I, I think he's right in that area where if you wanted to argue it's not enough, I wouldn't fault you for it. No doubt about it. We're on with Greg Bishop, senior writer for Sports Illustrated. And one more for me on the quarterback uh, line, and that is Jimmy G now having shoulder surgery on his throwing arm. You know, how much is this going to impact them keeping him and maybe be around longer? Maybe they even have to sign him. I'm giving him a bonus based off uh, – the timing of this, I don't know, is a contract and that uh, trade that affect, you know, his you know trade status, I, I would say. It's really interesting because they kind of need answers to everything and don't have any answers for anything at all. You know, they they loved Trey Lance last summer and spring. I think he's a very unique talent, but I, I do believe they lost some confidence in him over the course of the season. Then you look at Jimmy G, like I would have said a week ago, there's no way he's still in San Francisco next year. But the fact that he is having surgery and that he won't be available until August, according to reports, mm -hmm. you know, to me speaks to like, will you get enough for him? You know, can you do enough there to make it feel worthwhile? And then I also think I wouldn't keep them out of the Aaron Rodgers derby if he ends up moving teams. And so none of these things can happen without one of the other dominoes sort of falling first. And right now they don't have clarity on Lance, they don't have clarity on Rodgers, and they don't have clarity on Jimmy G. I, I imagine that's a pretty uncomfortable space to be in. Mm. Greg Bishop, senior writer for SI. Blaine's cousin. Yeah. All right, on, on the way out, I wanted to ask you this, uh, just covering the league the way you do. Um, if, if a Titans fan said, okay, write a story 
or if your editor came down the hall and said, write a story on what it would take for the Titans to go all in. What would that look like? I'll ask you the cliff notes. What would that look like? The Titans going all in right now. Mm. Well, I hadn't really thought about okay. that. Uh, I would say to me, in light of our discussion today, Ryan Tannehill is really interesting, right? Like there's a guy that to me is the top 10 quarterback in the NFL. He's played amazing at times. He's mm. played, uh, a hair below amazing at other times. And he's one of those guys, I think, where you have to go, I like him, I want to pay him. He's been amazing for our franchise, but do I feel amazing about putting him out there in the kind of games that I need to win? So when I look at all in, I see I see a roster that's pretty complete. You know, like great great receivers, uh, you know, seem to be pretty good on both sides of the line. Like it seems, seems like it's a really well-built team. And the question to me would be, can you win a Super Bowl with Ryan Tannehill at quarterback? I think the answer is yes. But my instinct when you ask what all in would look like, to me it would be to go out and get the missing piece like the Rams did. And, you know, in some ways the Rams got several missing pieces. But I think the Titans have a lot of good defensive players. I think Jeffrey Simmons has really become a star in the NFL. And to me an all in would be Aaron Rodgers or something like that. Mm. Hey, Greg, fantastic stuff, man. We know you're busy. We appreciate you jumping in uh, for a couple of minutes with us today. People need to follow you just like I do on Twitter at Greg Bishop SI, uh, senior writer for Sports Illustrated, uh, SI.com, or just subscribe to the old school paper one, like I still do, that gets dropped in the mailbox <laughs> every month I do. Been a subscriber my whole life. Greg, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate God it, guys. Yeah, thank you, Greg. You always got time for family, you know. Let me know. Hey, Amen. Man. The Bishop <laughs> family, check it in. All right, when we come back, there are a bunch of little receivers that are super fast. I, I found an amazing thing, a list of little receivers and how oh. they've done in the NFL. Oh, were you on the list? It, it, no. I'm a Thurston quarterback <laughs> in my dreams. We'll be right back. Number 80, <laughs> number 84.
Keith was on the uh, NFL Network this morning. He got pretty much the whole season was on commercial break. He got asked by, I believe it was Andrew Siciliano, um, what time he got paid 26, what do you think? And he said, I think wide receiver makes a lot of sense. Well, you start looking at the wide receivers, they all got weighed and measured today, and there's all these little guys. Who's the little tiny dude from Memphis that everybody's talking about? Have you guys seen that guy, Calvin? Um, Austin? Is it Calvin right? Austin? Is it Austin? The third? Or something uh, like that. Yeah, there's uh, some letters after his name, which are actually I think, numbers. I think that's his name. And that dude is tiny. Although he was in as small as he measured out to be like 5'8", uh, and uh, 170 something, I believe. I'd have to go back and look at it. But it got me thinking about this. We keep talking about that. Hey, yeah, Calvin Austin the third, yeah, for me. Calvin Austin, good pull there. So Blaine has said this all along, and I don't want to forget that. Because I think a lot of people look at the Titans and go, well, they need a slot guy. They need a little guy, just a slot guy. And, and your thing is, no, they need a receiver who can just do everything. You need good receivers. Mm-hmm. Don't just draft a guy who does one thing. You, you've been pretty adamant about yeah. just draft a great receiver who, who can line up in multiple spots if that's what it takes, you know, scheme-wise from week to mm-hmm. week to week. Outside, inside. Right. Uh, yeah. So, in the answer to your question earlier, Lucas, I said, the most recent successful quarterback we said in the first segment of the show with eight and a half inch hands, Michael Vick. Ah. Eight and a half inch Well, I was going to put that, that out on social media. Worked out with him okay. Uh, yeah, he used to th- throw some punts. That's what he did. His throws were punts. This was him, him and Jeff Blake, I think, threw the <laughs> highest balls ever. Jeff Blake threw the best looking deep ball. Luke is like, who's Jeff Blake? Yeah. Google Jeff Blake. Uh, that, He's kind of a journeyman Porter Viag. For, the, for the Bengals. Some real great years with the Bengals with this mm-hmm. receiver, Darnay Scott, out of San Diego. Well, uh, and Carl Pickens. Carl Pickens, too. Or UT. Um, every sub 185 pound wide receiver drafted in the first two rounds since 2000. I'll go back and find the guy who tweeted this out, but there's a graphic, and it's like, okay, because there's there's some under 185 guys this year. And the little guy from Memphis, people are saying he may work his way into the first round. Uh, Austin? Yes. Oh, I saw at oh. least one that had. Uh, saw at least one draft guy saying he thought he could get there. So, uh, here they are. Uh, Tavon Austin, the smallest one, 2013 out of West Virginia, 174 pounds. He was the eighth pick overall. Oh, I remember him. Now, this guy was productive. No, he was, but he was uh, quick and fast. Who is the guy that used to be, Lucas, you may not remember, from Florida? That every time he... Percy Harvin. Percy Harvin. Yep. That is the only exception. He could. He was quick and fast. Now that was a lightning bolt. Austin Trayvon Austin. This kid. He was a poor man's that. Yeah. Uh, the, the second they're doing it by weight. The next guy was 178 pounds. I can't believe this is all he weighed. He played forever in the NFL, and there were several times I wanted the Titans to give him Ted Ginn. Oh yeah, he was. But he was only an outside receiver. And a, and a nice kick returner. Yeah, he, he was a off. great kick returner kick in college uh, at Ohio State. I remember, but he took one back in a bowl game. But yeah, he he that's how his career like really continued on, and because he had elite level speed. But he had he but he was tall though. How tall was he? Yeah, but he was yeah, but he was super skinny, no doubt. Uh, Santana Moss was next, two thousand one out of the U. Well, Santana Moss was pretty. Yeah, he was legit. Sixteenth overall pick, Marquise Brown, uh, hundred and sixty six pounds. Uh, he was twenty fifth overall out of mm-hmm. Oklahoma, and he had some days, but not. Really yeah. Good. I remember this okay. guy, R.J. Soward out of USC, 177 to Jacksonville, given the first round. You played against him. Yeah, yeah, he was number 18 or yeah, like that or in college. He was just, he, yeah, he, I, and I thought he was going to take off, but he never did. I, I just, I don't know why. I don't know if it was injuries or what, but he he definitely showed some potential there. But, uh, no. Nah. I think we got some mic issues for a minute in the chat. Uh, Dennis Northcutt out of Arizona. Remember him? Cleveland Browns, uh, 32nd pick overall in 2000. Yeah, I played against him, I think. Yeah, he was just okay. Todd Pinkston, Eagles second-round pick. So, it's first. It's actually they did it by where they were drafted. So, we're in the second round now. Todd Pinkston, 169 pounds. And he was skinny. He I mean, he was, was a toothpick. You know what's so bad, though? You know, we used to go live and practice. I hit him a couple times. He was kind of durable. Yeah. He took shots. It was he just get up like doop da doop da doop. It was I was, it was uncanny, man. And he he but he had some elite level speed too. I would give him that. But yeah, he was way tougher than I ever expected. 
2008, Eddie Royal out of Virginia Tech. He went to the Broncos in the second round. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ran a 4-3-9. Titus Young in 2011. He went to the Detroit Lions out of Boise State. He was 174. Uh, Paul Richardson out of Colorado to the Seahawks. Most of these guys ring some kind of bell. He didn't. So what, what's your summary of all this, though? What do you get The summary is, is I was going to read the next guy. They're, they're oh. Rondell Moore, Roscoe Paris, Tutu Outwell, Dester Jackson out of App State. 2008, Deshaun Jackson out of California. He weighed 169 pounds. Yeah. And that's and the he's guy. he's still in the league. Still in the league. Yeah, he, he forced his release from the Rams, unfortunately, being a Cali guy. <laughs> and then he went to the Raiders. Yeah. So he was a blazer. He went to Cal Berkeley. I remember him. The, he some, was a great punt returner, kick returner, and uh, and this dude was tiny now. 169 we, pounds. We, we had him in studio here. He was down for uh, Cromartie's uh, football camp in charity event, you know, that he had. He was going to play basketball and all that. So we had him on air in, in here. Dude, if he would have told me he played in the National Football League, I would be like, man, quit playing. <laughs> Quit playing, man. And then when I saw him play, I could in the league because at this time he was still young. I mean, you know, he had really impacted the game yet. I was like, "Ooh, that's the same too." <laughs> he had blazing speed. Yeah, he really took off when Mike Vick got there to Philly. I mean, he was throwing those atomic bomb type passes, and he was just he could run for days. Yeah. That's why he's still in the league. I, I think he views himself now because he's at the end. Yeah. I think he's trying to get a ring, and then he thinks – I think he thinks he's a Hall of Fame because he's played so long, he's got numbers. Yeah. He's got some numbers. And you were asked, okay, what's the end game on this? The end game for me is Ted Ginn became a journeyman and more of a kick returner. Some of these guys had flashes in the pan. Deshaun Watson is the one because the responses to this tweet and again, I'll Deshaun I'll, Jackson. Uh, Deshaun Jackson. I'll go back and try to find the the guy who tweeted it so I can uh, so I can say okay, it was this guy. Give him the credit, but because it's a great graphic, I'll retweet it so anybody can see. Or actually, I think I already have the takeaways under the tweet were that's not much of a club or wow or gosh, I thought some of these guys would have done better. That scares that scares me on the tiny person receiver on the guy under one eighty five. Mm-hmm. That's which is I'd never said that, but I'm not a big proponent on the, these small guys don't have a lot of success in the National Football League. And that, that's, that's what I've been saying. That's all the first and second for since 2000. Yeah, that's why everybody who keeps saying, oh, we want the Wondell Moore or the guy. Like, I said, well, if you go look, that guy doesn't have a lot of success in the league. Now, there's always going to be a flash of playing a guy, that, one or two guys that get, you know, they do really well. But in college, those guys are fantastic. Now, if you're just asking them to be a role player and return punts and kicks and then be like the jack of all trade comes in, maybe your fourth guy kind of then matches up against the guy, his elite quickness is definitely going to benefit him. But the guys are so fast and so long yeah. and big in the National Football League, they can make one guy miss. But in the National Football League, there's 11 guys hunting you down. And if one misses, then there's 10. And if you don't run to the football, just imagine Jeffrey – Simmons, how he runs to the ball. Now, imagine then he got a steam runner and he goes hits one of these dudes. Other thing, too, about these dudes, Blaine, is as small as they are, as soon as their quickness is gone, as soon as the speed, they get dinged up, nicked up. No, that's it. There's they, nothing they, else. They, they don't have no, anything can else. Do. Can't survive. They're that's, gone immediately. Yeah, that's why I said the model, if somebody looks at the history of the National Football League, it's usually the six-foot height-wise a receiver, 185, 190, Ish and great route runner, four four, uh, can do pretty much anything. Very agile, really athletic. This guy, a good guy to say that's the model. He's played for a long time. Nobody will ever look at him as elite. Emmanuel Sanders he played with the Bills this yeah. year, with the Steelers initially in his yeah. career. Then he went to the Broncos, and now he's with the Bills. That is kind of the model guy you're looking for that can do what you want to do at wide receiver, and that may. That, you know, be the bottom level for me when I'm when I'm scouting wide receivers. All right, we've said this. We've given those numbers. Jahan Dawson is a guy a lot of people are mocking to the Titans. What are his measurables? A guy who a lot of people pick for the Titans. We'll give you that and more and headlines, including a huge NFL headline next on Blaine and Mickey. Yeah.
It is 2.04. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzica. Workouts continue today at the NFL Scouting Combine in Indianapolis. Wide receivers, tight ends, and quarterbacks getting work in on the field today at Lucas Oil Stadium. 104.5 The Zone coverage of the Combine is presented by Scoreboard Bar and Grill. The Buck Rising Show will continue to broadcast live from Indy through the rest of the week. Women's Hoops, the SEC Tournament continues today at Bridgestone Arena, Missouri and Arkansas. Just wrapped up in overtime as eighth-seeded Arkansas defeats Missouri 61-52. to Up next, Vanderbilt taking on 23rd-ranked Florida, a 230 tip-off. Vanderbilt advanced after a win over Texas A&M on Wednesday. The winner between the Commodores and the Gators will take on Ole Miss in the quarterfinals. Later today, Miss State and Kentucky at 630. Alabama and Georgia at 830. The winner of that game will take on the Tennessee Lady Vols in the quarterfinals tomorrow. You can hear all the action on 1045thezone.com or the 1045thezone app. Elsewhere in college basketball, OVC tournament play tipped off yesterday. Yesterday, Tennessee State defeated SIU Edwardsville 77 to 62. The Tigers play SEMO today in the quarterfinals. That tips off at 6:30. And Lipscomb is in the A Sun Tournament quarterfinals tonight after defeating North Florida on Tuesday. The Bisons play top seeded Liberty for a 6 p.m. tip. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once and your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 1045 the zone. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Talking hand size today. It's hand measurement day for quarterbacks. Kenny Pickett, you don't want your team to have him eight and a half inch hands. So it's a, it's a mm. no-go for Kenny Pickett, apparently. This is a headline right now on the NFL Network. No, it is a go. Quarterback Kenny Pickett's <laughs> hand measured eight and a half at the 2022 Ooh. NFL Ooh, I'm hoping he, he slides all the way down. <laughs> Number 26. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you were telling us that there was one other elite quarterback. Uh, a lot of people would know his name, of course, that the eight and a half uh, hands uh, didn't bother him too much. No, I saw this this morning when the eight and a half hand news broke. The whole sports world right now is about eight and a half inch hands. This is the NFL Network, receivers, quarterbacks, and um, um, receivers, quarterbacks. Tight ends. Tight ends are about to run today. And Kenny Pickett's hand size is the dominant thing. He's 6'3 and a quarter, 217 with an eight and a half inch hand. That's the whole focus of the sports world. And I saw somebody today tweet the last quarterback who was serviceable too good in the NFL who had eight and a half inch chance was Michael Vick. Mm. Yeah. He had so it didn't bother his worldly gifts. Well, yeah, he was much more of a runner. Pickett Ooh. actually can run, but nobody's going to be able to. I mean, Mike Vick was a whole different guy. But as far as throwing the football, I don't remember him having any issues throwing the football. Remember what the ball looked like when he threw it? Oh, man, like an atomic bomb. It, whoa. Man, he was. I got to play against him, man, when he was at the Falcons. Yeah, yeah, I sacked him a couple of times. I got lucky. <laughs> yeah, sure did. You blitzed I, him and sacked him. Yeah, yeah. When I was in Philly, Ooh. we played him in the uh, first round of the playoffs. Uh, that I would tell a story that I w got real close on that same blitz, and I, when I get you in my uh, radar and I lock you in, I get you. <laughs> <laughs> I locked him in, and I got literally a uh, uh, elbow away. And next thing I know, this dude <laughs> pulls away from me like a jet starting off the oh. runway. Woo! And I go, oh, my. And literally, in game, I'm like, I start felt like I was running in slow motion. I was like, how did he get so far away from me? And I was right next to him. Yeah. yeah this guy is explosive. Did any other quarterback make you feel that way? Never. Ever. He How many other people one. even did, though? Much less a quarterback. Uh, You're right. None. Not even a receiver. <laughs> oh. Not a running back. Oh, Michael freaking Vic. That's why. <laughs> remember, we. that's why I wanted to remember he was, a, you know, before all the issues. Out, oh, right. He became things. a free agent. I was like, hey, man, I, I don't know, man. The Titans may want to bring him in as a backup. Well, I think that was afterwards, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but he had gotten out. But uh, yeah, the, he he was a different level dude. He was on that elite spectrum as far as just uh, as far as talent. Uh, he was special. And yeah. Blaine's right, Lucas. You probably too young to remember him. He could throw the ball a mile. Yeah, yeah. Like you didn't have those conversations coming at it when he was out of Virginia Tech, right? Like you did mm -hmm. with Lamar Jackson. Like, oh, he's a wide receiver. He's a running back. No, 
That wasn't it. That, you no. Know, no. I might have been too young. That no. wasn't a conversation. No, they never oh, really no. said that. No. Well, he competed for a national championship in his time. He did. Yeah, they did. I mean, Lamar did Jackson they beat won Florida Heisman. State? No. Who did they They play? lost in the national championship. They I lost think, to Florida State. Yeah, I think yeah. to Florida State. Yeah, he, yeah, I remember Samari Rowe telling me about that story because he played in that game. Yeah, he said Michael Vick. Because he, oh, here's what I can say. Oh, I'm glad Doorknob just reminded me. <laughs> he said, uh, "I said, hey man, I remember that game. I remember watching that game. You were what number were you? You know, I remember games." He said, "Oh yeah, I was number two. I was like, oh, I, I remember. I remember you was chasing him." <laughs> I said, "He pulled away from you." He said, <laughs> "He said." <laughs> I said, "Dang, is he that fast?" He said, "He is fast." And this was when I was still with the Titans, right? So then I go and get to play against him when I'm in Philly. And I was like, oh, my. I caught him slipping that first time. I, I thought I was going to get the ball out, too. I was pissed. but uh, And he was not a big human. Oh, no, no. He's only 5'11". You know, he's not a big dude. No, not at all. Well built, but he, he's not a, you know, yeah. Not a big statuesque quarterback, 6'4", you know, the 230-pound guy. No. Lucas, I'm that's another thing that they're special, going to talk about man. some of these guys, you know, in the NFL, you know, when I look at uh, like here at Ritter or uh, Corral, what will be their durability in the league? Uh, even Pickett, who runs a little bit, uh, he definitely has mobility, you know, taking shots. How is their body actually framed? That's why they have the guys have on sh- shorts so they can see they're actually framed and how their body's built. Can you put more mass on? You know, are you thin framed? Are you real super skinny? Or you would that mean you you be able to you know get you know break legs and arms and things of that nature? Because you're gonna get hit. Nobody talks about it, but the quarterback gets hit more than anybody. Because even after they throw the football, sometimes they get hit. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they fall. And as defensive players, we're taught to fall on them and put all your weight on them, uh, so they can feel that blow as time goes on within a game. So those are, you know, I don't know if any of these guys going to, yeah, I don't know if anybody's going to question any of these guys. What's his name looks, I don't know how tall he is, but the Cincinnati kid seems really thin. But, Desmond Ritter. Yeah, yeah, but nobody brings that up about him, though. Big hands, yet. though. What's that? Big hands, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got big hands, yeah. He's long. He's a long guy. And what's so funny, uh, Pickett, you know, everybody's talking about his eight and a half hands. I think he measured at, what, six, three and a fourth? Or something so he's you know he's really a six yeah, four he's guy. Six three, yeah. You know, six, three. you know, the NFL is always going to measure you shorter. You know, I was five, almost five ten my entire life, and then I get there, they say you're five eight and three fourths. What the <laughs> five eight? I haven't been five eight since the <laughs> sophomore in high school. Yeah, so there. So when everybody does this, then I go, oh, okay, he's really like six four. Now I'm not going to go back and look at the, you know, you know the media guide and say, oh, this is what they said he was, but I'm not also going to take away from how the league measures you there. They, everything about the combine is, is so is, is such a great event, but everything is to tear you back down uh, for whatever reason and to find all these nitpicking things to make people think about you as a player. Uh, I, I just, is always interesting. And, you know, everything revolves around the quarterback that's why none of the guys really work out there. If they're graded as a first-round guy, they're going to do everything besides the physical and the meeting the coaching staff and having conversations. Uh, you don't, you know, you're not going to work out. But guys in my situation, naturally, you had to work out. So they picked and prodded. And you know, the hardest thing, the actual physicals. Man, them pulling on my legs and knees and doing the side backs and all that crap. They trying to straighten out those bow legs. Oh, man. Huh? And then they said, oh, man, at that time, there wasn't a lot of history of guys playing in the league uh, a long time uh, that were bow legged. And they were like, oh, if he tore his ACL, he's not going to be able to come back. And, you know, they, they started looking at, like, I think this guy's name was Odom, who was somewhat similar. He played with the Bills, number 37. They kept talking about him and, like, well, he, he's got, he tore his ACL. He came back. And, like, because my knees were real loose. And that kind of benefited me, really, to be honest. Cause it, they would take my knee and move it up and down and go, hey, man, you ever tore your ACL? I said, well, no, but you make me feel like I just <laughs> tore. I was doing stuff like that. I was like, but it feels not too good right now. <laughs> Real talk. I was like, man, you just, I mean, can you, uh, you know, take it easy a little bit? I mean, no, I haven't had any issues with my knees. I've never had any problem. I, I never got hurt in college. Never. 
I never got hurt. I was the lucky one. Not gonna. I, I just never got hurt. You so safe now. You don't. I got. You know. I, I uh, like. You know. Uh, had a high ankle sprain in high school. That that was it. Back then it was like, oh, it's just an ankle sprain. And it was like, man, I'm limping this for a week's end, man. Is something right? <laughs> well, you can't play running back anymore. You got to play DB. We're gonna put an ace bandage on it. Yeah, they they put the skin stuff on there, and they just made it. Oh man, it was. I couldn't even move that thing. I was playing. A, Watch this. I played in the state championship at corner with two interceptions with some high top of Vias on. Have you ever heard of Vias? <laughs> a Vias. Like basketball shoes? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no studs? No studs. Basketball sh- Was it yeah. inside the Hoosier Dome? Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. You, so you were playing That's on where the state championship Crappy turf are. in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Just, uh, people used to play in basketball shoes, though, yeah. in like the Silver Dome and the Hoosier Dome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's NFL players. Yeah. Vias, you should have gotten a sponsorship deal. <laughs> like we missed out on opportunity here, <laughs> especially when I went up and got their interception basically on one leg. I tell, but, uh, I'm telling you, man, yeah. I should have been your agent. So, yeah, so, NIL, so I, I was very familiar with the dome. Put it that way. Uh, I felt like I was at home. <laughs> that was your home away from home. Big win yeah, in there right. against the Colts uh, oh, in, after man, the 99 I season. I didn't win nothing when I did that combine work out. <laughs> We're <laughs> like, we got to X him off our list. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's right. got stiff hips and he's bow-legged. What, that, no word. That's it's a like... recipe for success. <laughs> uh, I mentioned this off the top because we got, had a whole discussion about little receivers and the success rate is not great. Jahan Dotson, who a lot of people are, are mocking to the Titans, 5'10 and a half. 178 uh 30 and three quarter inch arms he does have decent sized hands nine and a half but only 178 pounds i like this kid i for whatever reason i watched him play a lot penn state is always on tv so uh yeah he's explosive he can run routes um he you know he's electric so there's nothing that he can do i mean he can get up to 185 easy so yeah and i think he's more of a 5'11 and a half type guy. They, what they list him in? 5'10 and, and a half. half. Right. Yeah. So, I he, just remember watching that nine overtime game against Illinois. Oh, no, he's ridiculous. Penn, but Penn State just wouldn't go to him in, in overtime with the right. two point conversion. Right. They just would not even look at him. It was infuriating. And they lost the game, probably yeah, deservedly well, so. That's what you get. And then James Franklin said somebody else is getting raised, and then he got another million dollars because mm-hmm. that's the way that works. Uh, John Glennon, I don't know if he makes a million dollars covering the Titans. But he, but he got does, a raise, though. He does a great job <laughs> for Sports Illustrated. It's Sports Illustrated Day here on the show. John Glennon next with the Titans talk from the Combine. That's who he worked for? Yeah.
Boy, to Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. I, I, eh. <laughs> oh, that's not the right song, huh? I mean, it fits. It works. Oh, man. Uh, you When you 2 plays this song live, Bono does do a lot of that. Oh, okay. During the live performance. All right. Well, you know, I'm not the big music buff like you guys, but uh, <laughs> you're saying, all worldly, and Mickey's just been in the, you know, he he was born a musician. I've just lived in the world longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, but uh, what, 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 I, I've asked both of you guys this like three times. What's the song I'm trying to get for my, my dog video? Uh, riding dirty. dirty yeah, yeah, riding dirty. Blaine wants to make it. You, you, you my realize wife. all you've got to do is tweet out that video of Ziggy the dog and say, would somebody make a video of my dog with riding dirty? And you would get the most amazing oh, submissions because the people who listen to this radio station are geniuses. Oh well, you can DM me like, how do you put music to? Blame wants riding dirty with his dog riding in a car because he's got his car to car dealership. I guess getting something fixed or whatever. Then around you don't see anything but empty parking lot. Well, my wife, I, I yeah, she my was, wife, she was she, got, she drove she was ahead of us and, and taking her on her phone. Car. Right, she was videoing us coming. So they come around the corner, and the dog is, like, riding dirty, like, leaning out of the car on yeah, his side of the chilly. car. Yeah, he's chilly. Can I tweet it from Blaine and Mickey account? Yeah, yeah sure, man. Just say, you hey, can we, tweet it out now. Did say, hey, man, wants riding dirty. We want some riding dirty. Get to music. work. Do, do your thing, uh, Twitter. Um, oh, it's because, yeah, Lucas trying to get out of a job duty because he don't know how to do it. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to add the music. Well, I, I mean, I'm thinking you're young. Yeah, you know how to do everything. That I just choose to be ignorant on when it comes to technology. All right, all right. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got to go down this road. First of all, he said he does not listen or watch TikTok. Even us old heads are watching TikTok, man, every time. I don't have the app. I refuse. I but, refuse. But you're looking at it on Instagram. You're yeah, looking at the TikTok it. song yeah, there. You can't miss it. It's yeah. everywhere. I see, like, stuff on Twitter. Like, I spend all my social media time on Twitter. Like, 99.9% .9 of it. Right. Well, you know. You know you, I, you know, I know, because it takes a lot of time to do the Blaine and Mickey show. I, so. I got on Twitter <laughs> when the last, remember the brief NFL lockout that was like 10, 11 years ago? Do you remember that? There was it was brief in the off season. Do you remember this? If Lucas, you were baby, you remember this? Me. Lucas there was, was like, like a brief in NFL like, I got on Twitter. Uh, Ten years old. He wasn't paying attention. Somebody to said, get out. on Twitter and you can follow it. So I joined Twitter and like the first tweet that I saw was Michael Griffith saying they told us to go home. It was something like that. And I was like, wait a second. Tell you when you get it. I would, we're waiting on John Glenn, and he's supposed to check in with us here any minute. I thought, wait a second. Oh, I oh I joined in 2010. It's on your Twitter account. So I'm I would have joined about. To, I would have joined the same You're time. You, you said 2011, right? But okay, 2010. There was a. I, That's when I joined. There was a brief. Oh, I'm gonna have to go back and look, or somebody will remember this. Joined uh, January 2011. So I did join in 2011. I did remember. But at that time, now you can search. I don't Google a lot of things. Sports questions, there, I Twitter search them. I don't even Google them anymore because you can find brand new information about everything on Twitter. And if you're not on Twitter, I mean, you're not missing anything. But if you are on Twitter, you can get real-time, immediate information all the time. Usually it's uh, ahead of uh, at least maybe 30 seconds ahead of ESPN. Even. Right. It, it'll be on Twitter. Mm -hmm. A reporter will tweet it out. Then it'll be on, like, the crawl on ESPN. And I realized, because I was sitting in Jonesboro, Arkansas, doing three hours a day by myself, and I'm trying to give a little bit of reference on this NFL labor dispute that seems to be going down. And I said, well, it looked like there was some goodwill, but it's all over. Michael Griffith of the Titans just tweeted, "They, you know, we're going home. They told us to go home. Whatever it was. About it was real time. Hmm. So, I mean, if you are a sports person, you may think, I, I don't want to see politics. I, you can mute words that you don't want to see. You can tell Twitter, don't put COVID on my timeline, whatever. Don't put lemon ice box pie on my timeline. It'll just do away with it. You yeah. just put the words you don't oh, want. Oh, I think that's why the NFL did that. I said, do not have NFL COVID protocols anymore. And it, and it just it, and it said, okay. And the NFL commissioner sheriff said, done. You got it, Blaine. Well, John Glennon. It's like Siri, you know. John Glennon <laughs> joins us now. Uh, JG, uh up at Indy cover in the combine. So there's obviously combine news, John, but something that's big, something. Oh, okay. Lucas just said you're back. So for people like you who are out there on the beat every day, COVID protocols being lifted in the NFL. This is huge news for a lot of reasons.
Absolutely. Uh, John Glennon, our guest. What were your biggest takeaways from John Robinson and or Mike Vrabel's comments yesterday? Yeah. We always pencil John Glennon into our starting lineup on Blaine and Mickey. He is at Glennon Sports on Twitter covering the Titans for Sports Illustrated. Well, Judge E, staying with Harold uh, Landry, do you think it's a possibility they could tag him and then trade him? It usually doesn't trade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, you must have been inside my mind there, JG. You went with John Glennon with SI. And that is, I think they're going to take an outside pass rusher in the first round with 26 pick because I don't I don't think the Landry thing is going to work out. It may. I could be wrong, but it's still early yet. Do you know of, uh, I guess, some outside pass rushers at this point in time that, you know, that would pique your interest to set the combine? Okay. Oh, 
Oh, did you? Florida State. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's at the senior bowl. Rush. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's what I think, too. You know, strength of the draft is the O-line and outside linebacker pass rusher, guys. So uh, that, that should uh, benefit the Titans if they go down that road. Last question for me, and that is the O-line turnover. And I, I was hearing some comments about Dylan Radins. It didn't make me feel very confident at all based yeah. off of, you know, I guess what they think of him. But I thought he did actually pretty decent in his one game as a starter. I think he was at tackle in that game. But, uh, man, uh, what, what kind of turnover do you expect uh, from uh, the previous year going into this next season? And even, you know, we assume Nate Davis, everything is, is kosher there, and he'll be back even though he needs to get back to his previous level. But then at right tackle, you know, David Quisenberry, I, I think, was originally, you know, brought aboard as more of a, of a swing backup kind of guy. And, and do you want to move and, and get somebody to, to plug in ahead of him? And, yeah, the question you asked about, about Dylan Raidens, I think, is an excellent one because I think there's a school of thought out there that, Okay, Dylan Radens was our second-round pick last year. Uh, you know, even though he might not have played a lot as a rookie, okay, it's time to plug him in as a starter. And, and I'm just not sure that we saw enough to convince anyone that, that he is ready to start. In fact, you know, we, we asked Mike Brabel that question yesterday, is, is Dylan Radens ready to start right now? And he said no, uh, not not mm-hmm. right now. And, yeah. you know, obviously there's a few months until the next game, but – um, you know, yeah, he had, he played a, a solid game against San Francisco. You know, I don't I don't think um, we should go too far in 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 praising that game. And and mm-hmm. you know, there's never been a question about Raiden's willingness. You know, his work ethic. Any any of the questions that came up about uh, you know Isaiah Wilson have not come up about Raiden's. But I'm just not sure he's the guy. You know, the, the last snapshot we have of Raiden's um, the playoff game against Cincinnati. He's inactive. He's he's a healthy scratch, and there were eight active offensive linemen for the Titans in that game. So that you know, basically, that the Titans are saying there were eight guys that were going to be more valuable to us than than we thought Dylan Raiden could be. Mm. I don't know if that's a that's a great look, uh, you know, for a guy <laughs> that, that you know is is uh, going to be considered as a, as a starter moving forward. Mm. Well, with uh, JG John Glennon from SI. All right, JG. On the way out, let me ask you this: You were you were there. You you felt the vibes. You heard the GM and the coach. Did you leave there with any impression that if the right guy was there at twenty six, they would take a quarterback there? Uh, you have you have read my mind uh, because uh, I, I'm in the midst of uh, of doing a little article on that uh, okay. for, for coming out uh, mm. later. You know, I I don't think that would be the case, and here's why I don't think. It would be the case because I, you're almost certain that Ryan Tannehill is going to be your guy next year, right? 
and and so your quarterback, if you if you took a quarterback in the first round, he's probably not going to play this year. So basically, if you're, if you're the Titans at that point, you would be saying we're not getting anything from our first round guy, and we don't even have a second round pick. So you know, <laughs> those are the, the the two key picks uh, selections that we're not really banking on anything for next year, and we're considering ourselves in a win now mode. Don't you have to have somebody in that first round pick? you know, that, that makes an immediate contribution. Uh, so that, that's why I lean towards against, but it, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility, you, you know, because the, t- the quarterbacks are, are going to be, I think certainly still a few decent ones are going to be on that board at, at 26 when the Titans select. And, and the argument for is, you know, you, you, if you find somebody you like and, and you think, uh, you know, he's a guy for the future, you got to get him, and and you can even afford to sit him for a year and and let him learn and and uh, work behind Ryan Tannehill. So, not out of the the realm of possibility. And and I think there are some good guys, not not necessarily great quarterbacks, but uh, you know, stranger things would have happened if if the Titans go down that road and and take a quarterback. Well, obviously, uh, interesting stuff, and uh, we'll be watching for that article uh, on Sports Illustrated where all your great work goes. Again, at Glennon Sports on Twitter. Follow him there. John, thanks for the uh, thanks for the time today, buddy. Thanks, AG. Okay. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, thanks. Hello, Irishman. John Glennon right there. All right, when we come back, what did John Robinson, what did Mike Vrabel say about Ryan Tannehill yesterday? If you didn't hear those comments, or even if you did, you will want to hear them next on Blaine and Mickey.
Blaine and Mickey, 104. <laughs> oh. 104. There, oh, there's my soul. <laughs> this is, there you go, Ziggy. Ziggy is coming around the corner. Did you post it? I, I just texted to you. Blaine's dog. Yeah, you texted is to me, but you didn't dirty. post it, though, did you? Ziggy. No, no, no. I texted you the finished product. Did oh, somebody okay. make this for us? No, I, I made it. You made it. Yeah, I, made, I, I found a way to do it. <laughs> okay. Oh, so it's on there? Yeah I, yeah, I texted to you with the song on there. Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't looked at it yet. Oh, okay. Now I get to post it. I'm Blaine's post dog it. on a joy ride. Uh, yeah, at the he, 23. he was, he was riding dirty, Twitter. man. That's I, how he rolls, I don't man. have TikTok, so I made it on Instagram Reels and then screen recorded it because Instagram won't let me export the music for <laughs> oh, copyright. I knew you would not <laughs> let me <laughs> down. Took you two hours. Took you an hour and 48 minutes. <laughs> well, he was doing request. multiple jobs, I by know, the way. Busy. I mean, come on, if man. If you get clipped by Chameleon Air for copyright issues, then I'm wiping my hands. Hey, well, I'm going to say you did. Just you can quit. see I that he not, sent it to me. I do not own the rights <laughs> to this music. Uh, a lot of talk about the quarterback Ooh, situation. And the hand size and Sam Howe's hand is I, nine and eight. I, exactly. Nine and, eight. and pro football talk, doing this whole article yesterday, are Titans in the market for a quarterback? Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, John Robinson has to say that because you know he desperately wants to trade pick 26. So they have to seem as interested in everybody as they can mm. just in case a Matt Corral is there. So somebody oh. will be like, what if the Titans are going to draft him? Oh, we got so, to that, go there. That, so that's why they say, yeah, well, if it, you know, it could yeah. be a possibility we take a quarterback. For the future, you never know. We'll look at any position oh, for the future. The smoke everywhere. Don't know when to tell the truth or not. Uh, J. Martin Ramon called it the season of lies. Well, they also Ooh. spoke about their current quarterback, Mike Vrabel and deception. John Robinson. I know, Lucas, you've got those. Which one you want to start with? Let's go with J. Rob. John Robinson on his quarterback at the Combine yesterday. No, I think we're always looking to, you know, to, to add players to the team that we think, you know, either from a developmental role uh, can help the football team, uh, from a depth role can help the football team. Um, you know, Logan's certainly done – he's improved. Um, you know, Ryan's done – has made a bunch of great throws for us. Yeah. He's played a lot of good football for us. Uh, unfortunately, he had a bad game or two last year, and, and, and that sticks with you, especially when it's the last game of the year. Recency bias is tough. You know, so – um, and he knows he's got to be better, and I know he's going to work his tail off to be better and improve, uh, just like all of our players are. Um, but I think that position, you know, you're you're always looking at that position because it's such an important position, maybe the most important position to the football team. So that's John Robinson with our own Buck Rising and his appearance before he spoke to the media, uh, but started it talking about, well, yeah, I mean, you look at every position, and then, you know, Ryan made some good throws, but, boy, he messed up some too, and uh, – he knows he can't do that, but that was uh, that was John Robinson with Buck Rising. What did Mike Vrabel say about his quarterback, Ryan Tannehill? Because as Blaine pointed out several times, we had yet to hear from the head coach about his quarterback mm -hmm. since the last game. So this was what Mike Vrabel said yesterday in Indianapolis. You know, there are things that we all evaluate, and it when, when we when we make mistakes at the end of the game or the end of the season, uh, I think that's that's what you unfortunately what you have to point to. And uh, Ryan's won too many games for us. Uh, he's been a part of too many huge victories for us. Done too much for us to, to use that. Now we all we have to be better. You know that's unacceptable. Ryan knows that. He'll tell you that. You know can't make some of those mistakes. Uh, but there's also you know, he's not the only one out there making mistakes. Uh, I've told you this. It'll never be about one person. I know how critical the quarterback is uh, to the success of the team. But. Uh, you know, we'll get back to work, and, and you know, I'm confident that, that some of these issues that we had in all three phases will get fixed. Do you think bring Mike Vrabel and John Robinson talking about their quarterback? What do you hear when you hear them saying the things that they are saying? Well, Vrabel, I, I thought, did a really good job. I thought he was honest and trite. I mean, at the end of the day, I thought everything he said was uh, on point. So it, it, would, it didn't make me feel any different or better. I is that hey you know hey he had a bad game and uh, by Jr. and then Rabel saying he knows he can't do that and uh, he know but he wasn't by himself there were some other issues there you know so I would say it tells me that they need to get their line fixed he took too many shots last year uh, he forced too many balls it's obvious in his stats he kind of went back to maybe one of his better years in the Dolphins he started looking more like that guy mm -hmm. well guess what they didn't have a real good offensive line either there. Uh, so let's get this line showing up, and we got to quit doing these three-step drops and let him feel comfortable in the pocket where we can actually see where he's at because he was, you know, it was chaos in front of him all over the place, and he kind of was in there amongst all the, the giants uh, and then letting it fly. So 
and see what he can do then, and then hopefully uh, we can keep this thing rolling at the same time trying to develop a younger quarterback. So it tells me maybe they move back uh, with 26 pick. Maybe somebody wants to get in there to get a quarterback in the first round, and then they move back, get a maybe 31st or maybe two seconds, and then kind of continue to build the team with some quality players. Uh, JR in the first round picks, sometimes he hadn't had success there. So yeah, second rounders, yeah, so for sure. Most of them, except for the die, the quadruple zero. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, ooh. someone said it looked ooh. like his jersey. Yeah. Remember, I said that I yeah, was like, man, it, it looked like, like it just says ooh. four zeros, man. But four yeah, so zeros. you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> Tan Hill is exactly what we've been saying. He's going to be back, and we hope he does better, and maybe we can get better around him, and then he plays his best when it's on the line. I would go get me all the weapons I could get. This is from Tron Davenport. The Titans have met with Carson Strong. They have met That's with Sam. from Nevada. I've Sam, never seen him play. Sam Howe, and they are going to meet with Desmond Ritter. All those guys will probably be draftable at 26. They're going to meet with those cats. So if this is a roost, they're keeping it up. Yeah, man, we're looking at quarterbacks. And I'm going to just tell you this. I haven't watched Strong, but – I'm not liking any of those options at 26. I'm just telling you right now. I'm not jumping up for joy. Well, they're all going to run today, the receivers and the tight ends. So we'll be talking about how fast they are or aren't tomorrow and more. But right now, we got to get out of here fast because 3 hl is coming up next. We got to get out and enjoy this weather. In the meantime, in between time. Yes, sir. Peace.